Uh, okay, thank you. My name's Ahmed Tuzi. I'm a senior lecturer at University College uh, London, and I'm going to talk about some uh, research that has been performed by our group and other groups in the visual system, and how that's helped us to understand what happens in the brains of um, people with MS. And I'd just like to start by um, showing a sort of basic organization of the visual system. If you just focus on the diagram on the right-hand side, this is the view underneath the brain. Um, light signals, they enter the eye and hit the back of the eye, which, uh, at the retina, uh, where light receptors are found. And there, the information is processed into electrical signals, which are then carried um, along the optic nerves behind uh, each eye. And they end up at the back of the brain, where visual processing occurs, or main part of visual processing occurs. Um, now, uh, why study the visual system? Well, it's obviously a very um, important sensory system that we have, and um, actually, it, 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 can in, it can be involved in multiple sclerosis in many different ways, and it, and it is quite commonly affected in um, MS, but one of the more common conditions to affect MS um, is this one, which I'm sure you may have heard of, optic neuritis. This results in focal, uh, an, a small area of inflammation and swelling that occurs in the optic nerve uh, and can result in uh, loss of vision to the patient. So what does the patient experience with optic neuritis? Uh, okay, so they may get blurred vision, which can be mild to quite severe uh, in nature. They can also get loss of color vision, which again can be very variable. As doctors, when you look in the back of the eyes, uh, we can see that the nerve itself can look a bit abnormal. It can look swollen and blurry, um, as, uh, as shown on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is a healthy-looking um, optic nerve. This is the view we get when we look at the back of people's eyes. <clears throat> Why study optic neuritis at all? Well, there are several reasons, but the, the two main themes I'd like to address in this talk are the processes that occur in optic neuritis under the microscope. We see that they're very similar to uh, what happens in lesions in other parts of the um, MS brain. Uh, that can be responsible for relapses. So if we can understand the mechanisms that cause damage, I mean, it, it may, we, it, it'll help us to translate this knowledge to uh, lesions affecting other parts of the brain. And um, the second reason is that in optic neuritis, there is, the condition itself tends to recover by, by itself naturally. So it provides us with a natural model to study recovery. And if we can understand the mechanisms of recovery, it may help us to work out how to enhance them and so result in better outcomes for patients. So the rest of the talk I'm going to focus on this, me these mechanisms of damage and um, towards the end mechanism of recovery. Um, one of the tools to use is MRI which provides us with detailed pictures of the optic nerve itself and different types of MRI scans can give us, can allow us to investigate different aspects of the processes that occur in optic neuritis. So in the early phase we see uh, tend to see inflammation and there can be demyelination and swelling and these can be all captured with different types of MRIs and uh, in the long term there may be persistent damage to the optic nerve which can result in um, shrinkage of the optic nerve and all these things can conspire to affect um, detrimentally uh, visual function. This is an example of what we see when we're looking at inflammation um, uh, using an MRI scan in which contrast is injected into the arm. Um, on the right-hand side of the picture, the, the, the inflamed optic nerve comes out brighter than on the left-hand side. Another type of MR technique that uh, we've been using is uh, this one. It provides us with it's a value called MTR, or magnetization transfer ratio. And this, we think, provide, uh, gives us an indication of how many uh, nerve fibers are lost and also the degree of myelination uh, within the nerve. And the study we did, we did this study a few years ago looking at what happens to these MTR values in optic neuritis and found that early on there's a reduction uh, in MTR values, but later on towards the end of the year there seems to be a slow increase uh, which possibly suggests some form of remyelination. Another type of uh, imaging technique which is different to MRI is this one, OCT, optical coherence tomography. 
Um, you can think of this really as a type of ultrasound that provides detailed images at the back of the eye, but it uses light waves instead of sound waves. And uh, initially, old, older OCT machines uh, gave us uh, fairly crude images of the back of the uh, retina, at the back of the eye, but uh, uh, second generation machines give us much more detailed images from which we're able to sort of segment or discriminate different sub-layers within the retina. And the reason this is important is that the, the top layer on the, on the bottom image, the top layer called NFL, the nerve fiber layer, that's the one that tends to interest us because it's directly connected to the optic nerve. And when the optic nerve is damaged, that layer can become thinner. And an, an example of that is shown in this slide. On the left-hand side, there's a, there's a sort of thin white band um, along the top of the, uh, the, the retinal layers. Uh, and this is in a, an unaffected eye, but on the right-hand side, after optic neuritis, the optic nerve has been damaged, and it has thinned, and as a result, this thinning has been transmitted into the nerve fiber layer, which is um, very thin, at, almost ha hardly visible at all. And that, that's also conveyed in the, the sort of color thickness maps above, where blue and green uh, colors show thinner uh, layers. Why is this important? Because it, it, can, it gives us with quite an accurate tool, a handle with which we can measure putative therapies that we think might be able to protect the nerve fibers from long-term damage. Uh, and in fact, we're using this tool at the moment in an ongoing uh, neuroprotection study in which we're uh, looking at the effects of uh, phenytoin, which Gavin mentioned earlier. So phenytoin is a sodium channel blocker um, and we've just heard about sodium channels from Maria, so and there are, there's evidence from animal models that it may protect nerve fibers from uh, damage in the long term. So we, we want to see whether, if we give phenytoin to people with uh, acute optic neuritis, with uh, early optic neuritis, uh, whether that's able to protect nerve fiber layers. So we're hoping to see that they end up with thicker nerve fiber layers when they take phenytoin as opposed to uh, placebo and we're about halfway through, almost halfway through recruitment in this trial. So I've talked about damage mechanisms. I just want to spend just uh, two minutes on uh, recovery mechanisms. Most of the recovery mechanisms, we think, still happen around the site of the lesion. So the nat there are natural healing processes which occur. I briefly mentioned remyelination, but there's this other concept called neuroplasticity where other parts of the brain can sometimes be recruited when certain um, areas of the brain are damaged, and they, they become more active um, in response to the damage. And we, we found this in optic neuritis, that early on, after, relatively early on after optic neuritis, there are the orange or the hot patches there, they show that other areas of the brain are more active than they should be. Um, and this is, we think this is in response to optic neuritis because these areas die down as patients recover. But it, it could be that some of these areas are not um, actually doing anything, they just they may just be a response to the damage. But using some sort of slightly more sophisticated analysis, we found that a few of these areas actually do contribute to the recovery process after optic neuritis. Now they do form some type, they, they do represent a form of um, neuroplasticity, uh, as the term is. So, um, this is just a summary of what I've gone through. We've talked about mechanisms of damage, and mechanisms of recovery, and the reason we're interested in these, these two aspects is that if we can find out, by understanding the mechanisms in more detail, it may help us to develop treatments which may either limit uh, damage or enhance uh, recovery in some way, and so provide better outcomes for patients who are affected by it. Thank you.